This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Welcome to the How to Run for Office podcast from My Campaign Coach. Every week I mention Campaign Sidekick and the power that it can bring to your campaign's ground game. Not only do they make this podcast possible, but I use the platform every week to manage and canvassing teams I work with around the country. In the last month alone, it's helped efforts I've been working on to knock over 50,000 doors across multiple states. It's fast, easy to use, and completely reliable. Check them out at campaignsidekick.vote. Our guest this week is a fellow Hillsdale College graduate. Ian Swanson is the host of The American Way and co-host of Omaha's Morning Answer radio shows on 1420 AM The Answer in Omaha, Nebraska. A native Nebraskan, Ian graduated with honors from Hillsdale College in 2014 with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Economy and is currently pursuing a Master's in Public Policy at Liberty University. Ian recently ran for the Nebraska Legislature and came incredibly close to beating a popular incumbent in a hotly contested race. When he isn't defending the Constitution on the airwaves, Ian can be found drinking lots of coffee, supporting his Nebraska Cornhuskers, and reading anything possible from Winston Churchill and William Wilberforce. Ian, thanks for being with us today. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Raz. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you on. We've had a lot of candidates on the podcast and campaign folks, but uh, I'm I'm really excited to get your perspective as somebody that's a young guy that's run that it uh, did very well, but ended up coming up short on the, the election night. Let's start off, before we get into the kind of the mechanics of your campaign and a lot of those lessons that you learned, talk to me about how you got involved in politics and, and kind of a little bit of your backstory. Sure. So I've always been in, interested in, in running for office. I mean, I'm a Hillsdale College graduate, so I suppose you get that love for liberty and it just, the fire burns and you want to make sure yeah. you can get involved as soon as you possibly can. Kind of started looking at it um, after the 2014 cycle got through. Um, my then Republican congressman got beat and was one of only two Republican incumbents to lose. He kind of shot himself in the foot, and that's kind of why he did. And I said, wow, the Republican Party is fractured. What can I do about it? So I had been working for the party at the time, and I said, you know, I think I really should uh, run for office. It was a Republican district. We're really weird in our state. We got nine partisan elections for our unicameral legislature. So, you know, a lot of the dynamics are very unique here. Um, and so I was I had a Democrat representing me in my state legislature. And I said, you know, this is a Republican district and nobody wants to take this guy on. So somebody has got to do it. So I, I just called a, all of the people that I trusted and said, hey, do you think this is something that um, that somebody should do. And they said, man, you, you're going to knock on the doors. You're going to do the work. We really think you, that you could have a shot at this. Um, and so a year and a half later, the, the campaign season, uh, all the way through the end, it was a remarkable experience. And um, I, I hope that whatever lessons that I've learned uh, can help other candidates experience all the joys of it. Uh, and get that extra 3% that I didn't get in my race. <laughs> I, I definitely understand that. Well, and you've obviously learned a whole lot from those lessons. You and I talked, you know, shortly after, after the November election when you lost there and, and it was, it was really impressive to me already what you processed through and what you learned about what you did wrong and what you were, uh, we were very happy with as far as how your campaign performed. Before we get into that though, you know, what prior to Hillsdale, what, what kind of political involvement do you have and kind of how did that shape uh, your desire to eventually run. What was this a a long time you know family thing you were involved in in politics? Um, my my parents are worship leaders, so so no, I'm the first person to kind of really be involved with it. I worked on a number of congressional campaigns before, so I mean I've been around campaigns. I, I knew a little bit about how the bigger ones worked, um, but but the first time really having a, a super active role outside of a congressional campaign, you know, for anything local, was deciding to run for office myself. So you had a whole lot of heavy community involvement and deep ties there from, from growing up there in the Omaha area and your parents' involvement through church and everything. But coming out of Hillsdale and getting involved there, you know, as far as the congressional and local elections, that was that was really your first taste. So this is a that was a big step to, to go you know, jump right into to running yourself. Yes, and, and it was interesting given, you know, you go away to school for four years to come back. I, I'm I'm 25 now, but I was 23 when I made the decision to run. So it wasn't a whole uh, long time after I graduated that I'd made the decision to do it. 
Um, so I had a lot of community connections and some political connections, but uh, oftentimes those two were in different camps. And so I had to try to find right. ways to bring people together and share that one side of my life with the other side of my life, the political. So how did you approach that decision to run? You said you had a few folks that approached you about it. You've been asking people about who might be able to run. Walk me through your thought process. You're a young guy. You knew you were going against a, a pretty powerful incumbent. This is not going to be an easy race. What was your thought process? What were some of the questions you were asking yourself as you did that? Yeah, uh, kind of if not me, then who? If not now, then when, right? So if you have an incumbent that's, that disagrees with you on every major issue, in a district that needs to elect a conservative because it's a two to one Republican district on paper, it's suburbia, it's, you know, it's like the prime district for a takeover opportunity. Um, if I w wasn't willing to step up and do it now when you know, I'm not married, I don't have all of these obligations um, that other people have, knowing that I do the work, then, then why, how can I basically say I passed up an opportunity to, to be a member of the team to try to help uh, flip liberal seats to conservatives in our Nebraska legislature, knowing all of the issues that we were going to have to face. So um, uh, Governor Kay Orr, former Governor Kay Orr, um, was the very first person that said, oh, my gosh, I, I want to you know, endorse you and get out and help. And so her help was absolutely essential. A, a lot of people said no at the beginning. They didn't think that a 23-year-old kid had any <laughs> right. chance of doing it. It's, it's pretty rare in Nebraska to have younger folks that, that run because we only have 49 seats in our state house, unlike – you know, uh, New Hampshire, where it's seemingly everybody is elected to office. Mm -hmm. um, so the dynamics are different, but you just have to work hard. You just have to prove to them that you are um, truly committed to it. You know, make the phone calls, knock on the doors and, and really, uh, you know, take that whatever crack in the door that they give you and shove it open to try to, you know, make yourself a more viable candidate. That's really admirable. I mean, taking that opportunity and saying, look, somebody's got to do it. You looked around and couldn't find anybody else, and nobody else wanted to take on the guy. Uh, it's and it's also kind of a weird setup. But I, I, no, no offense to the Nebraska, but the way you guys have your legislator set up is kind of weird compared to a lot of the rest of the country. It's it's nonpartisan, right? You're so That's right. while it's a two to one Republican district, uh, you're running it as a nonpartisan office. So it's not really a Republican versus Democrat as far as the R and the D are not prominent things that are attached to you as a legislator. Every a lot of the the people that are in the know know where you stand, but you know, much like a municipal election here in Texas or in a lot of the rest of the country, uh, it's not quite as easy to draw that t that clear party affiliation yeah. when, you're, when you're running. So that, that kind of had to make it weird, especially given the, the 2016 effect when you're running there. Did, did that impact yes. the race? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it doesn't appear on the ballot. That's what that means. It's, so it just says nonpartisan next to our name. So it's incumbent upon every candidate to make sure that you know, Republicans knew that I was the Republican and that the other guy was a Democrat. And it, uh, it, so it, it really plays with the traditional coalitions because name ID is really everything in a race like mine. And I was going up against a former um, high school principal that everybody knew, everybody's kids went to their school. And so uh, even though they all knew him, my job was to just continually remind them he's a very liberal Democrat. You're not a very liberal Democrat, so vote for Ian, right? So you can c continually pound them with information about that. Um, and so it, it's hard because in, in my state, the, the budgets are, are, I mean, between 100 and 150,000, depending on whether it's a, a open seat or, or, or a challenger race. So it's, it's not like a lot of people do TV because I'm still in the Omaha market and there are 10 of the 49 legislative districts that that one market serves. Mm -hmm. So yeah, really you're just not able to target very well using the TV there. That's right. So it's it's really direct mail, knocking on doors, social media, you know, website marketing, those kinds of things. Very grassroots ways of reaching out to folks. Um, and, you know, it, at the end, it was tough seeing numbers because we, we just we had a Democrat congressman the last two years and then we just elected a new congressman in our district this year. So it was it was tough on election night seeing, you know, 800 votes in a precinct for Trump, 850 votes for uh, now Congressman Bacon and, you know, 500 votes for me. You know, so yeah. we, I wish we could have done a better job of just making sure that Republicans knew that I was the Republican. But at some level, you know, you, you have a finite budget and you got to make do with what you have. That's definitely one of those areas where, you know, every area, every municipality, state, they have their own idiosyncrasies. 
and you definitely got you know slapped upside the head by that one. It's it's <laughs> really tough. I mean, it's it's one of those things where you know I've seen you know, state senate elections here in Texas where you'd have people zigzagging on the ballot. They'd vote you know Republican and one you know for right. president, Democrat for state senate, and then Republican again for house. And that's very rare. It takes some pretty erratic behavior to do that. In your case, uh, because they didn't know who was the Republican, who was the Democrat, you know, they went with the name that they they knew the most, and that that's a tough thing to overcome, especially when your opponent has you know near universal name ID. That's right, and and, and even oftentimes when you go to a door and you tell them, hey, I'm the Republican and he's the Democrat, you know, you're a Republican. Here's all the issues that we agree on. It, it's still hard for people when it's a nonpartisan race. To get over the fact, well, you know, he taught my kids or, you know, we go to church together or something like that. It, on, it seems like on national races, it's easier to get people to recognize the importance of voting their party or at least voting their ideology. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. even if you're dealing with um, th- those kinds of differences as well. In my in my case, I'm a, I'm a very much a liberty conservative running against a very much Bernie Sanders Democrat. So the, the contrast could not be uh, more stark. Yet, uh, you know, not enough people were able to realize that that contrast. In cases where you had success with that, I mean, obviously you didn't have as much of a budget or the time as you would have liked to be able to get out that message. But I'm sure in some cases you're able to, to hit home with that message. What was it that helped pull people your direction? How did you convince them of that when you were talking to them in person? Yeah, so I, I kind of focused on two main strategies. Number one was... Um, showing off the endorsements. I mean, and, and by the end, it was pretty much every big name Republican in my state that, that was on my endorsements card. And especially given the fact that I'm, I'm, I was 24 at the time, um, you know, just reminding people, hey, all of these other folks, I know you think I'm young, but all of these folks that are in elect, elect, elected office, excuse me, um, believe in me and, and want to see me win. So, you know, get on board with the Republican team. And then the other one, you know, you do your standard uh, contrast mail pieces, you know, the side by sides. Here are all the issues. Here's Ian's position. Here's uh, Senator Kalowski's positions. You know, it's pretty straightforward, right? You name the issue and we mm-hmm. were going to be on our, our, our opposite sides of it. And when people read it, when people considered those messages, they were very surprised in most cases, even though he, we knew he was a liberal Democrat four years right. ago when he got elected. So it it was just a question of trying to break through in the 2016 race when all the energy and oxygen was focused on the presidential race and to a lesser degree, our congressional race, getting people to understand the significance of my down ballot race was a challenge. um, And that's why door to door was such a primary driver of messaging for me. When you were first building out your campaign plan, you, you had to consider the fact that you were first you had a primary then you had to go up against a strong incumbent in the general. So what were you thinking and kind of what was that process as you were building out this campaign campaign plan? You talked about the importance of fundraising, you know, door to door. Uh, you wanted to raise a bunch of money to make sure you had your name out there and you could maximize name ID. What was that process looking like for you when you first started that campaign? So first, the first thing I, I tried to do was reach out to the elected officials that I thought um, would endorse me early. Because oftentimes, you know, if you're a new candidate, especially if you're a young candidate, you need to be able to tell people. And, oh, by the way, you know, Omaha Mayor Gene Stafford endorsed me or, yeah. oh, by the way, former Governor K. Or just to get your foot in the door to be able to ask for fundraising uh, to get your name off, uh, to get your campaign off the ground. So I picked a couple of those folks that, that were um, courageous enough to be willing to endorse early. And then you capitalize that on trying to drive people to events um, where they can just hear me talk. Uh, and as a as a Hillsdale graduate, as people went throughout the campaign, they said, wow, as soon as I heard you speak, I really understood that you were serious about this and I wanted to support you. So then my job became putting myself in front of as many people as possible to share the message with them about why I cared so much and why I thought they should care so much and how they could help me. So how'd you do that? You talked about the door to door what um you know how did you build that door to door program was it just you was it your know, family members volunteers paid vendors how did you build out that program yeah primarily grassroots it was it was going to county party events going to tea party events uh, rotary clubs speaking in front of those kinds of things civil society groups and then tons of family and friends from church you know they they were the ones that were out there early and often and kind of building the support reaching out to college students and um all of the kind of natural markets for me as a young conservative 
And then as as more and more people came in, then of course they told their friends. So a lot of it at the beginning was word of mouth marketing. And then it was getting in front of the the like-minded groups that could say, okay, there's not going to be a, a more stark contrast of any um, of any um, race in the state this year. This is this is one that I know we can flip, and this is why where your help is going to be the the most important. So I'd imagine that the experiences there on the campaign trail they kind of fall broadly into two buckets. One are the things that you are that went exactly the way you wanted them to, that you're really excited about, <laughs> and you felt really well prepared for. And the other side are the ones you're like, man, I wish I could do that differently. If I could go back again, I would probably leverage this knowledge to have a different result. So start out on the, the fun bucket, that number one, and say, what are some of the things on the campaign trail that you really felt like you were well prepared for? And as on the execution side, you absolutely crushed it. I, th- I think that we hit uh, more doors than we than we expected at the beginning. Um, I think so that was a, a real a plus. We knew how important it was in a race that's based on name ID to get in front of as many voters as possible, as often as possible. And there's no better way to do that than knocking on a door in my suburban district. So we really, I think we did a really nice job of that. Um, towards the end of the campaign, I think we did a really nice job of, of trying to, to target voters in the way that we were able. Um, my, my mail vendor um, has a lot of individualized lists, you know, lists of renters, for example, or or lists of you know single people and those kinds of things, and then we actually wrote uh, individual letters to those um, groups, those segmented lists, with a message specific to um, that list. So, for example, the the most famous one, I, I wrote a letter to renters. I am a renter, and one of the first attack pieces that my opponent put out said, "Ian doesn't understand what taxes are because he's never paid taxes. Um, he's never paid property taxes, and how can he possibly understand?" Uh, tax burden. So I wrote a letter uh, and I sent it out to all the renters saying, now you know as a renter that we pay property taxes. We just pay them indirectly through our rent. So how you know, right. how appalling is it that you know you're, you're, this guy is saying we don't understand the need for uh, tax reform? So you know those kinds of things, capitalizing on those, those were, those were really effective and I got a really good response from people that received that letter. So as you were building out that block walking program, what are some of the things that you learned that helped make that so successful? You know, think about this through the lens of you know, our listeners who are wanting to build a better campaign this cycle. What kind of information can you give them about how you built that to be so successful? So number one, the, the most important lesson I learned was to be overly prepared before your volunteers walk into the door. So what we would do is we would segment the list, uh, split them up into chunks by how long we thought they would take based on the number of doors and and the length of time Um, so that when volunteers would come in primarily on on our big super Saturdays, we would have all of these lists electronically and paper walk books prepared so that they could walk in and and they could say, okay, I've got two hours today, Ian, what can I do? And then we'd hand them a list or we'd upload a, a list on their walk book app so that they knew exactly how much they could get done in a short period of time. They walked right into the door to our campaign office they grabbed what they needed and then they went right back out into the field so um and and having food and drinks there so that they 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 couldn't waste any time yeah they could just grab a water bottle and get right back on the field it it takes a little bit more work on the front end but you have uh, more motivated volunteers they know that you appreciate their time they feel appreciated and therefore in my experience they they came back time and time again to, to knock on more doors that is awesome and that's one of those things that from the process side and the planning side, you're right. It takes more time, but it saves you a lot of dead space in your schedule. And what I mean by that is that those volunteers, if they walk in and you're ready to send them right back out, that saves you a significant amount of time. Those 15 minutes or 20 minutes when they're waiting on you to get stuff printed out and ready and everything, maybe that means you've got to get up 15 or 20 minutes earlier to in order to do it, but you, their volunteer time is so important. You want to make sure that that's another couple of doors that they get out there and knock instead of waiting around for you to do you know, basic campaign functions. That's absolutely right, Raz. And, and the other thing about that is, is it, even if they're not door knocking, that principle still applies. So we had lots of you know, letter writing parties where they would write individual letters to voters, giving them on a postcard reasons why they support me and, and asking for other people's support. So we bring all the food. We'd have all the supplies ready to go. We had all the, the scripts you know, print it out on each individual station at, at, at our office. Everything was ready to go. So that the moment that people showed up, 
that they had no excuse for not working. We had music playing, you know, food. There was always an elected official there to encourage people to walk around or stop by. So there was a, a driver to get people to the event. Anything, any excuse we tried to, to, to um, plan for, any excuse that people would have for not doing it, we tried to eliminate that distraction so that the time that they, that they could spend, they knew that they were spending in a productive way that could earn me votes. I cannot tell you how many times I've been in volunteer headquarters where they haven't done that. <laughs> they've, given, <laughs> they've just given a laughably small amount of thought to how to, get, how to make people effective. And it's tough work. I mean, as you guys know from having done it so well, it takes a lot of work to task volunteers and prepare all that information in advance. Yes. Uh, it means yes, a lot of late nights and a lot of early mornings, but man, you get so much more out of your volunteers and in turn, they're so much more effective and much happier to come back because even though volunteers will oftentimes want those breaks or they may kind of just socialize or hang out, the ones that matter, the ones that are actually going to help you win, they're going to appreciate the fact that you're maximizing their, their time and you're getting the most out of their time that they're giving. By separating yeah. out the productive time from the social time, either in different events or having clear lines of demarcation between the, the parts, you're able to make sure that they stay focused to motivate them and also to provide them the social aspect. All of those are important. But at the end of the day, if you're wasting their time, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your donor's dollars, yes. and you're not going to win. And the last the last thing I will say about this, Raz, is that the, the, the best way, I think, to kind of manage that and facilitate that we would have, um, you know, another state senator or a city council person or somebody come in at the very beginning to kind of do the rah rah five minute talk. Here's why it's important. Here's how you can make a difference. And then they would leave or they would help. And then we'd have somebody else come back at the end of the allotted time. For example, if you're making calls, you know, right when the last call is supposed to be made, then that elected official shows up and they say, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And then you have a little bit of a social time where you know, it's already dark. You can't make any more phone calls. And then they can always ask them, hey, by the way, we're going to stay here for an extra couple of hours. You want to write some postcards with us and give them something extra, like extra credit that they can do. And the, and the last thing about it is we would we finally towards the end of the campaign, I think too late. But uh, we we learned this eventually to, to make care packages for people to take home. So even if they came to call, we would have care packages ready. That okay, can you take home 50 postcards and bring these back to us next week? Can you can you address them at work or when you're watching TV in the evening or something? Um, little tiny things. Again, depending on how much time they thought they could give, so that every time that they came in, they did something and then they left with a project, so that they had to come back in the door uh, at a. At a future point in which case we could say hey here's something else you can do <laughs> and try to maximize the number of touches that that person can have on voters well and when you track those assignments to people especially the ones they take home with them and you're able to follow up and encourage them to to complete those that's a really great way of keeping them motivated and exercising a little bit of social pressure to make sure that they're staying involved and help maximize what they can do for you and there's there's nothing against having a volunteer leaderboard to see who's doing the best not at all. Every chance you can to uh, to kind of gamify that process, especially when you're talking about folks that are regular and that they are motivated by that. You know, figure out what motivates your volunteers first of all, and, and this can be on a personal level, it can be on a team level, but figure out what motivates them. And by doing so, one, you're going to build a much better relationship with these folks because this is this should be a long term relationship that lasts not just through to election day, but that lasts. And they can be those people that are helping hold you accountable and hold you to your your original campaign promises and personality yeah. you know, throughout your term in office. So that, that's really important. But by having a good understanding of what motivates them on a personal level, you're going to know, hey, does this person want Chick-fil-A at their volunteer headquarters? Yep. Do they want pizza? Uh, do they want, you know, they, they really want flowers. If they do something great, I'll get, I'll get them flowers. Or do they want a gift card to Whataburger? <laughs> you, know, you figure out what, what really motivates them. And then you model your program about that. Because I've seen you know, as many different types of volunteer programs as I have campaigns. And they really need to be customized to you know, the different people that are helping you. Yeah. One, one more thing about the door knocking to go back just a little bit. Um, we, we gave people two or three different options of the type of door knocking that they could do. So for our best, most persuasive door knockers, as, as we kind of figured out who those people were, we would give them more, much more persuasive, persuasive messages. 
you know, where they, we actually would want them to, to stop and give two or three reasons why they, they supported me. And then for the folks that necessarily didn't want to talk to people, then, you know, we just give them a bunch of, of things to lit drop or, you know, Republican only pieces if they could use an app or if they didn't want to use an app, we, we had a, you know, a nonpartisan message that they could drop at every door. So again, I, I think it's so important to try to find ways that everybody can help and you fit um, the task to the, to the, the skills that they have because everybody wants to contribute in some way, but a lot of people don't think that they can because they think that they're either, you know, not in good enough shape or not a good talker on the phone. They don't have some kind of ability. So you have to get through that by saying, okay, well, here's something you can do. And in my experience, when you do that and you show them that you've thought about it, what they, how they can participate, they're much more likely to say yes to helping you. That's a really smart way to, to kind of bifurcate and, uh, and break apart those different abilities and make sure that you always have somebody because you never want somebody to have a desire to volunteer, but you don't have a ready-made task for them. You want to yes. always have ready-made tasks available regardless of what type of thing that is, whether it's, hey, uh, you got five minutes, okay, why don't you go take out the trash, or 15, why don't you go clean the bathroom, or you can't go you know, knock doors, or here's a phone, or here's some postcards to fill out. Or, oh, man, you can run, but you can't, uh, you can't actually talk to people at the door and aren't comfortable with that. Lit dropping. You know, having all those different things, that is, you know, kudos to you guys because that's really well run. I like that. So the other side that you talked about earlier is fundraising. And that's really important, especially because a lot of campaigns and a lot of candidates, I should say, they hate dialing for dollars. They hate talking to people. In Nebraska, you guys primarily focus on, it seems, on uh, on large events rather than necessarily you know individual meetings, those kind of things. I know you've right. some of all of those, but talk first about you know, how you approached fundraising in general. Was that was it hard for you to get to the point of asking for money? Was that easy for you? And how did you start out that process? Yeah, it was very hard for me at first to ask for money uh, because I'm always thinking about you know better ways that those people could you know use their money to pay house payments and such. But then I finally realized. It clicked. I'm asking people to invest in a movement. You know, right. I'm, inve- I'm asking people to invest in defending their liberty. I'm, I'm asking them to invest in a vision of lowering their taxes. And and once I got back to that point and I really digested that, I was much more effective in asking people to help in that. So the, that's it was more important for me. It was it was a more effective tactic for me to push people to special events with uh, big names, because in, in my experience, even though I would meet with a lot of people, unless I knew them personally, in which case it was a lot easier, if I was meeting somebody for the first time or kind of working off of a fundraising list, you know, based on donations previous, uh, it was a lot harder for me to convert that into a donation because frankly, a lot of people just saw a 23 or 24 year old right. kid asking them for money. So I pushed them to special events where they could see, you know, Governor Ricketts introduce me and endorse me and say nice things or somebody that they trusted so that then when I shared my 10, you know, five to 10 minute talk and then went up to them after that and shook their hand and said, hey, I really could use your help, you know, to to make sure that this happened. That to me seemed to translate into a more effective fundraising message than, um, just dialing. Although I did do that and I asked people for copies and, and I would meet with them and do those things. Um, but towards the end, I was, I was kind of doing a pipeline from calling, asking them to ha- meet me for coffee. And then at that coffee, inviting them to the next special event so they can see a lot of energy and, and meet other people and get excited about it. Well, that was really playing to your specific strengths. You knew right. that you had an incredible list of folks that would endorse you and that were endorsing you. You understood the policies, you could articulate the vision, but you were trying to overcome that hurdle of being a 23-year-old and having blonde hair and looking like a young guy that you are. Right. And you needed to to borrow that credibility from those endorsers. And then you know, once somebody said, okay, well, Ian might know what he's talking about, then they hear you speak, you know, okay, now they're on board. Now they're actually willing to donate. But you really took a, you took a hard look at what the pros and cons were from a donor's perspective you figured out what your biggest hurdles were and you address them specifically through how you geared your fundraising program. That's right. So when you're doing that, you focus through that pipeline. It's a very systematic approach that I think, well, it obviously worked very well. How much, uh, what was your original goal as far as fundraising? 
At the very beginning, I said uh, I, I would want to hit 100,000, and I pretty much hit it right on the nose by election day. When you were building out that number as far as how much how much you needed in that budget, uh, did, was that a, just kind of a, you threw a dart at the board? Uh, was that a, a broken down number? You said, hey, these are the different things we're going to spend the money on. How'd you arrive at that number you needed? I might not have had the, the most specific budget in the world, but, but I, I do know three or four of, of kind of the most popular campaign managers and campaign consultants in the state. And so I met with them and said, hey, you know, what's the number that you think I need to, uh, to run the kind of race that you know that I do in order to win? And that was the number that, that kind of everybody said, well, we don't think you can hit it. But if you did hit it, we, we, you, <laughs> Thanks would, for the confidence, you would have a guys. shot. Yeah. Gotcha. So you went through and from there you kind of broke out the budget and you built your your spending plan around that fundraising plan from there. Yes, I, I've kind of built three proposals, right? So I said, what's the lowest number that I could get away with running a decent campaign? You know, what's the bronze plan? That was 60. Then the silver. OK, that's that's a, a decent, a, a good campaign at 80. And then the gold plan, we, we got everything that we could need. That was the hundred number, and that's that's why we set that as our goal. Well, that's an impressive, a very impressive effort from both how you ran the pipeline for the fundraising on down through the budgeting process. It's obvious you were very systematic about how you approach it. I, I definitely think that's the right way to go about it. I hope that more of our listeners will kind of approach it that way because if you you take an inventory of your of your assets of your liabilities, and then you build your fundraising plan specifically to communicate who you are and why you're worth investing in to your donors, it's going to be much more effective than if you just you know, say, okay, well, this is what I believe, and this is my five-point plan, and you're conservative, I'm a conservative, therefore, you should cut me a check. And that's, yeah, and, that's the way too many folks do it. And the last thing I will say about that is is when, when I did call or, or dial for dollars, um, there are a couple, three things that I always try to put in every call. Um, one, which is, this is not a, a frivolous investment. I am going to get as close, if not win this race. Number two, um, uh, ask for a specific amount. And three, buy a specific time. And four, buy a specific per- for a specific purpose. So, for example, that's good. You've, you've, you you know that this donor gave a thousand dollars to three other legislative can- uh, candidates. You know, you get through your whole spiel. And then you say, you know, sir, uh, I, I'm trying to, to get out this mail piece, I'm I, I, our mail plan. I'm five thousand dollars short for this mail plan that will really help us pay for X, Y, or Z. Can you help us with a thousand dollars of that so that we can print, you know, uh, twelve hundred more rack cards or whatever, right? And and in my experience, if if you were specific and you had that foresight to say, look, I need the thousand dollars not just because I'm trying to raise a gazillion dollars, but actually because that money is going to be spent on mail. In, on this specific piece, if you can, um, to this specific universe, and I need it in the next week so that this this piece can go out. You really create that sense of urgency, and then uh, people respond a lot better to it because they they know that you're not going to waste their money because you've told them specifically what that money is going to be used for. Right. Yeah. Asking specific amount, specific time frame, and for a specific purpose does a lot to help lock down that donor support because. In many cases, you're talking about folks that, I mean, they obviously have some kind of money to give, otherwise you wouldn't be talking to them. And many of these folks have been quite successful, at least in a you know in their own life and in, in what they consider to be their goals. So the way they got there was typically by you know, having a decent plan, knowing good opportunities from bad on the whole. And if, when you can show them that what they're investing in is specific, it's measurable, and that you've taken the time to plan this out really well, they're going to have a lot higher confidence level that their investment is actually going to have some strong ROI. It really does uh, put you to the top of the pack because I can't tell you how many times people, when I said that, said, wow, you know, nobody's ever actually put it like that before on a call. And these are people that oftentimes they get called, you know, 15, 20 times in an election cycle because they're the donors, you know. So you can separate yourself from that pack if you follow that formula. And it actually – in some cases, means that they'll donate more to you because you've proven <laughs> right. yourself all that more impressive. All right, so we talked quite a bit about those things that you felt really confident in, that you felt like you did really well. Let's jump over to the, the less pleasant side, kind of the lessons learned. What are some of those areas within the campaign where you you, know, you wish you had had more preparation or you feel like you maybe fumbled the execution a little bit? 
Number one, I, I wish that I uh, could have listened to this call uh, at the beginning of the campaign because obviously <laughs> it, you, you get you get more efficient with it as you go along. You learn those lessons. Um, so, of course, you know, the, the first couple of times we had volunteers come out, it wasn't the most efficient machine in the world, but we quickly learned. So obviously, you know, every second that you waste when you're doing that is a second you wish you could have back. Number two, um, I think we could have done a lot more with individual voter targeting. Um, you know, we, we did a lot with purchasing lists and things, but that's not something that is really um, pervasive in Nebraska like it is in a lot of other states. Nebraska legislative races are really pretty vanilla. It's knock on doors, raise money and direct mail. And there's some radio, but almost no TV. And it's pretty traditional. And and I, I wish that I could go back and, and started doing those unconventional voter targeting, which is really like 21st century stuff, which we should have been doing 16 years ago. But um, I wish we would have done more of that earlier in the campaign, because uh, I think we could have done a better job of providing specific messages to voters earlier in the campaign, which would have broken through later in the campaign, because uh, we would go door to door and we would ask them what their most important issues are. And we got that data and we tried to message to it later in the campaign. But uh, the, the better if we were better organized earlier, I think we I think we could have leveraged it a lot better late. How would you have deployed some of that knowledge? Like what are what are a couple of specific areas where you're like, hey, I wish we would have done this. Are you talking about like social media targeting, better door to door targeting? What, what are you talking about there? Yes. I mean, social media targeting for sure. Um, I was not necessarily pleased with um, our performance on social media and you know on on the on the web that kind of targeting because we didn't really do very much of it because frankly we didn't ex we didn't know if we were going to have the budget for it until late in the campaign and then the other thing um, in terms of the individual voter targeting going door to door if we if we could have budgeted for it earlier I would have purchased the lists and things to to match with the voter file before I knocked on doors at the beginning. Because um, especially that first time through door knocking when I'm introducing myself to folks, if I would have had uh, more of that information earlier, uh, I think I could have you know, kicked my foot more in the door and, and made it more memorable for voters um, in that first round. Because I had a small enough district, they were, there were only about 19,000 votes cast in my, in my race. In, in, so knocking on 23,000 doors, you're going you're – going, uh, Everybody's every Republican's home three times and, and every uh, Democrat and independents at least once. So you really start to you know, people start to get to know you. And the more information that I could use to have a unique and specific message to them through uh, leveraging voter data, I wish we would have done that. Now, as you were preparing for the campaign, there, I'm sure there were there's a lot of stuff that you read and, and think resources you try to avail yourself of were. Were those all that you wanted, or did, were there more things that you wish you would have had access to? There are definitely more things I wish I had access to. I mean, I knew that there was this massive data operation being used on, on the Democrat side. I mean, obviously, we've all read David Plouffe's book on Obama 08, but I just I didn't know where to go. I mean, I, I saw the presidential race and you know, the cruise teams leveraging of it, and I said, is that something that I can even budget for? I mean, how do you go about doing that? Who do I talk to? And there, I, so I think that there just needs to be a lot more education um, of state parties and, and candidates about where they can go and, and actually how affordable and necessary that kind of voter targeting and leveraging is, especially for down ballot races where money and time is at a premium. That's definitely a subject that's, that's very near and dear to my heart. That's a lot of what caused me to, to start my campaign coach and, and part of the problem that I'm hoping to ameliorate. Right, I want to help provide opportunities and really bring in a lot of other people that provide education as well. That's part of why we started the podcast and bringing folks like yourself and others on because I love learning myself. <laughs> That's why I go to a conferences and I read and I bring on these guests because I want to learn from you guys and and a lot of these people we have on from you know Chris Wilson and a Josh Perry and on down yeah. the line. Are there specific areas you mentioned the voter targeting and some of those technological resources? Are there other areas within the campaign that you felt like you really wish you would have had you know, more preparation or more teaching? I, I wish I wished that I could have had somebody um, that could have sat down with me for the beginning, especially those the first hundred fundraising calls. I mean, that was it was a 
it was just a heart wrenching thing for me to, to do. Everybody said, OK, you got to call, you got to call. But I frankly didn't know the first thing about it. I mean, I called my family and said, hey, I'm running. Uh, you should give me money. And that's, <laughs> right. that's not necessarily a, the most powerful message. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that, that there are now people like yourself that are wanting to teach people how to do that. Um, it was just it was a very daunting thing to have to pick up the phone at the very beginning and go, OK, I have an event. Uh, you should come, you know, that. <laughs> It's not. It doesn't come right. naturally to me. Well, it doesn't come naturally really to, to anybody, it, regardless of whether you're prepared when you step into your role as a candidate or not. You had to learn these skills at some point, and you know, for yourself being a younger guy, you just hadn't had the opportunity to build those skills yet. And frankly, a lot of other candidates that are much older haven't had that opportunity either. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's a lot of why we want to help prepare people through our, both our free resources and our paid courses. But I'll give you one of the pieces of advice that I give a lot of people is when you're doing those first calls, even if you don't have somebody say an experienced fundraiser, just get somebody to sit down with you and help take notes. You know, put them on speakerphone, yeah. add another line or something like that. But have somebody that can listen to in your calls, even if they don't know a thing about fundraising, because they'll at least know something about interpersonal communication and helping you as they listen to what seems to work and what doesn't, because you're in your head. When you're making these first calls, yes, you're you in your head, you're trying to analyze everything you're saying while you're trying to answer the question, while you're trying to think through how can I do this better, all at the same time. And yeah. it really helps if you can just hand off part of that responsibility, you know, the taking notes, you know, thinking about things you need to follow up on, what seems to work and what doesn't. You know, uh, every now and then you'll say something and you're like, man, I wish I had that written down <laughs> because it was a really good yes. line. And you're like, I want that when I go out to the stump speech next week. Well, having somebody take some notes, if you got a, you know, a girlfriend or a you know, brother or a sister or somebody that can sit down with you, have them take notes. Have them write down some of that stuff. And after these calls, just have a brief break and say, hey, how'd I do? You know, yeah. one, to, one to ten. And uh, you know, what could I do better? Okay, take a breath, next call. And by keeping those notes, one, you'll probably come up with some good lines, some great feedback from donors because they're going to give you feedback too that you'll want to remember. But you're going to be able to do that a lot, uh, or will you'll have a lot higher level of sanity when you complete the calls. And with having somebody else there to kind of hold you accountable to make sure you keep slogging along, you're going to waste a lot less time as well. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's sage wisdom. Absolutely, positively. What else did you find that you wish you could have learned more about ahead of time or, or wish you would have done differently? I, I, wish, I wish that uh, somebody would have told me to be a little bit more forceful at the door. Um, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty, you know, well, well-mannered guy. I don't like upsetting the apple cart too much uh, outside of politics. And uh, <laughs> so when, when, when people would come to the door, um, I, I, I recognize that they are almost always eating dinner or something. But if looking back at the numbers, basically the way that it turned out was anybody that didn't give me an authoritative, yes, we support you ended up not voting for me and right. you know, the margin was just a couple hundred votes for me. So I wish I would have been a little bit more forceful by saying, Oh, you're hesitant. You're hesitant. Well, let me just remind you, you know, that, that I'm a conservative Republican running against the, the most liberal Democrat in my legislature. And this is a really important race. I, I wish that I would have learned to make that case a little bit more forcefully. Um, I, I, you know, you don't have to. You don't have to disrespect people. Obviously, you still right. want to respect their time, but just to just kind of up the ante a little bit more, rather than just saying, "Hi, I'm shaking your hand so you can see my face, and here's a piece of literature um, and my one minute, you know, elevator talk." To say this is really important. We disagree on bang, bang, bing, bing, bing issues, and I, I really think that uh, I'm really hoping that you'll support me on November eighth. Well, and as you're doing that, it's important for folks to remember that, similar to what you said, if unless somebody says, yes, I will support you, they're probably not going to. Uh, yep. this, uh, this is all a result of social pressure, right? So when my teams are out surveying folks, I'll see, you know, on the support question, we'll see, you know, yes, support, no support, undecided, refused, right? They said to shut up and leave me alone. So when I look at those numbers, like, for instance, I was working for a state rep this last uh, this last primary here in March. And I showed him the numbers, and he was like, "Oh, dude, these are awesome! You know, we got high yeses, we got really high, you know, we got high decideds. But if those break down the same as the yeses and nos, then that's gonna be great." And what I told him was, "Look, this is not polling data. This is not a scientific thing. 
It's uh, even most polling is hard to consider that scientific, but this is far from it. You literally have somebody in your campaign shirt showing up on, you know, Ian's front porch asking you to support this guy whose shirt you're wearing. Yeah. So, social pressure dictates that you know they don't want to get in the confrontation on their front porch. They're going to say un- that they're undecided at a higher rate than they truly are, and they're also going to say yes at a higher under- a higher rate than they are. What you end up seeing is that a number of the folks that say yes are going to, some of them are going to turn out to be truly undecided. And a whole lot of the undecideds, especially if you're talking about somewhere close to an election, those are actually no's, but they just don't want to tell you. Either because yeah. they're scared of confrontation or because they don't want the other campaign, the one they're not voting for, to know their true feelings. Yeah. So you gotta you got to keep that in mind. And you know, to, to your point, throughout the campaign, this, this changes a little bit as far as how hard you might want to push. You have typically got three phases, identify, persuade, and turn out. You know, you're going to have to vote phase. And when you're early on, it, you know, hopefully you're knocking doors really early and you're getting out there so you can make those multiple passes like you did on these doors. And in that kind of situation, you have some time. You have some follow-on contacts to have with these folks. And your focus early on is just to have an interaction and make it positive. Leave something positive behind, hopefully one or two of these bullet points that you got implanted in their head about you. And then as you move forward, the persuasion time, that's really when you need to start locking down the yeses. Because these people have, they've heard your name, they know something about you, and now's where you need to really spend the time in pulling your direction. And most of the time, you're not going to pull a no to a yes. But there'll be a whole lot of people a couple months out from an election, especially in one that's down ballot, where you can educate them and persuade them in your direction based on their key issues. Yeah. And so you've already identified kind of where they stand, whether they're persuadable or not. Now you're actually going to leverage that information and you want to pull them your way and you want to take that opportunity at the door, especially if you're the candidate, to talk to them and say, hey, what are your hangups? What is keeping you from getting to a yes? And find ways to help work through those. And don't just assume that because they're undecided that they're going to break your direction. Until you get that yes, don't assume they're going to vote for you. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, it's especially true, um, you know, as, after election day when you do the post-op. The numbers, everything that you just said is 100 percent true. And it's hard to believe as a candidate because you want to believe you want to take people at their word. You want to believe them when they say, oh, I don't know. Or, you know, I I just don't have time or of course I'll support you. Um, But you just have to continue continuously work under the assumption that you need to touch them more and touch them more and touch them more. Um, And and so I I guess I, I wish that I could have. I wish I would have known that so that I, I could have just continually reminded people of the stakes of it. Now, if you're a Republican running against a Republican, you know, maybe uh, maybe the, the lesson might be a little bit different in terms of, of making that contrast so stark. But, you know, for me, knowing that all I needed to do was convince Republicans to vote for the Republican um, and then seeing at the end of the day that a whole bunch of Republicans didn't come home, uh, you know, you, you wish that you could have just continuously reminded them of of the fact that, hey, there's only one Republican in this race, <laughs> right. and it's me. Yeah, you would hope that was easier than it actually turned out to be, but that's uh, it's an important lesson to know. Well, Ian, I really appreciate you being on here with us today and sharing so much of your experiences, you know, kind of the good and the bad. Is there anything else that you want to make sure our listeners get before we wrap things up? Just, uh, just that I, it actually was not nearly – as complicated and as hard as I thought it was going to be running for office. So for anybody who's considering it, it's a really tough thing. You have to go through withering criticism. The attack ads are never easy to stomach. But at the same time, if you're willing to do the work, if you're willing to put yourself in front of doors, if you if you believe in the cause, it, there is no more rewarding thing than saying, I put my foot into the arena. I fought a good fight. I, I, I ran a good race. And I made my principles proud. So I hope that despite all of these uh, comments and and good and bad things that we've been talking about, that uh, I can still encourage people to get involved in the political process and consider running for office themselves because we need a lot more good people to step up, learn these lessons, and go win. We absolutely do. I can't tell you how much I appreciate, one, you being willing to run, take that opportunity, and, and share with us the lessons. And I'll tell you what, I, I really look forward to, to seeing what happens next time you run because I think we'll be seeing some different results and uh, hopefully get to have you back on to share the uh, all the great things you learn on a successful campaign next time around. So thank you again for coming on this weekend. 
Uh, everybody check out the show notes for all Ian's content information and the links we referenced during the show. And we'll talk to you all again next week. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.